Some people really struggle with multiple choice questions. If this is the case with yourself, then working through this series of six videos should make you more likely to pick the right answer and avoid those other ones. Let's kick off with the first dynamics question. A vehicle follows a course from R to T as shown. The total journey takes one hour. Which row in the table gives the average speed and the average velocity of the vehicle for the whole journey? Let's get that table in and up beside the diagram. Straight off the bat, we can get rid of two answers, A and C. The reason being that speed shouldn't have a direction, since it's a scalar, but velocity should, because it's a vector. Next up, we'll calculate the speed of the vehicle. To do that, we need to find the total distance travelled by the vehicle, which is 2.4 plus 1.0, which is 3.4 kilometres. We then use this equation, which in the relationship sheet is written as V is equal to D divided by T. That gives us 3.4 divided by 1, which is 3.4 kilometres per hour. So the answer isn't B. Now we'll have to find the velocity of the vehicle from R to T. And to do that, we'll need to find its displacement, both size and direction. It's pretty clear at this stage that the size or magnitude of the displacement must be 2.6 kilometres, making the magnitude of the velocity 2.6 kilometres per hour. So in a multiple choice question, there's no need to waste time calculating it. It's also possible to find the answer without calculating the vehicle's direction. The directions given in answers D and E are both stated as bearings. And looking at the diagram, we need to remember that north has a bearing of 0, 0, 0. East has a bearing of 0, 9, 0. South is 1, 8, 0. And west is 2, 7, 0. The direction of the vector from R to T is somewhere between 180 and 270, meaning that our answer must be E. So you'll see that in some multiple choice questions, it's possible to arrive at the correct answer without calculating everything. If we did have to calculate the velocity, we'd first calculate displacement S, which would be the square root of 1.0 squared plus 2.4 squared, which is 2.6 kilometres. Angle theta is tan to the minus 1, 1 1.0 divided by 2.4. That's opposite divided by adjacent, which works out as 23 degrees. To find the direction of the displacement vector, we'd have to add 180 to that angle, giving us a bearing of 203. To calculate velocity, we divide displacement by time. The equation appears like this in the relationship sheet. That gives us 2.6 divided by 1, which is 2.6 kilometres per hour. The direction of the velocity would be the same as the displacement, a bearing of 203. Next question. A car of mass 1,200 kilograms is travelling along a straight level road at a constant speed of 20 metres per second. The driving force in the car is 2,500 newtons. The frictional force in the car is 2,500 newtons. The work done moving the car between point X and point Y is... And then we have our usual suspects as answers, but... Only one of them's right. The equation we want to use here is this, where work done EW is equal to force F times distance D. That means we'll not be needing the mass of the car or its speed. Also, the force in this question is the applied force. There are other equations which involve force like this one, F is equal to MA from Newton's second law. But in that equation, F represents the unbalanced force, which in this equation would be zero newtons since the forces acting on the car are balanced, equal in size but opposite in direction. So in this equation, we multiply the applied force, that's the driving force of 2,500 newtons, times the distance of 50 metres, which works out as 125,000 joules, an answer C. Just make sure you know what all the symbols in the relationship sheet represent for your exam. As always, there's a video about that in my channel. Next up is another question where some of the information given isn't required. A cyclist is travelling at 10 metres per second along a level road. The cyclist applies the brakes and comes to rest in a time of 5 seconds. The combined mass of the cycle and the cyclist is 80 kilograms. The maximum energy converted to heat by the brakes is... So this is basically a conservation of energy question, where one form of energy is transformed or converted to another form. In this case, the cyclists with their bike have kinetic energy initially. When they apply their brakes, work is done against friction and this causes heating. The loss in kinetic energy is equal to the work done against friction and this will also be equal to the maximum energy converted to heat. 
It's a maximum value because, in reality, energy would be converted to other forms, such as sound as the brakes screech. All we have to do then is use the equation for kinetic energy. Ek is equal to half mv squared. Substitute in the values given for mass and speed, and that's us. We get a value of 4,000 joules, so the answer is D. The next question is also about conservation of energy, except this time it's all about gravitational potential energy converting to kinetic energy. A ball of mass 0.50 kilograms is released from a height of 1.00 metres and falls towards the floor. Which row in the table shows the gravitational potential energy and the kinetic energy of the ball when it's at a height of 0.25 metres from the floor? Here's the table and here it is next to the diagram. If you're not 100% sure how to get to the answer in a multiple choice question like this one, a little knowledge might be enough to eliminate some wrong answers. To calculate the gravitational potential energy of the ball at this point, 0.25 metres above the floor, we use the equation Ep is equal to mgh. Just remember that mass m should be in kilograms and height h should be in metres. The value of g, the gravitational field strength on Earth, is given in the data sheet at the start of the exam. That gives us 0.50 times 9.8 times 0.25, which is 1.225 joules, or to two significant figures, 1.2 joules. So already we can rule out three of the answers. We don't know the speed of the ball at this position, so we can't use the equation Ek is half mv squared to calculate its kinetic energy. We can work it out another way though. First, we can calculate the gravitational potential energy of the ball at a height of one metre above the floor using the same equation as before. That gives us 0.50 times 9.8 times 1.00, which is 4.9 joules. So if the ball has 4.9 joules of potential energy when it's one metre above the floor, it must have a total of 4.9 joules of energy when it's 0.25 metres above the floor, except some of the potential energy will have been converted to kinetic energy. We already calculated that at 0.25 metres above the floor, the ball has 1.2 joules of potential energy. So the rest of that 4.9 joules must have been converted to kinetic energy. We can calculate how much by subtracting 1.2 from 4.9, giving a value of 3.7 joules. That means our answer is C. Here's another question which shows that we can often narrow down our choices by knowing just a little about the topic. A ball is projected horizontally with a velocity of 1.5 metres per second from a cliff as shown. The ball hits the ground 1.2 seconds after it leaves the cliff. The effects of air resistance are negligible. Which row in the table shows the horizontal velocity and vertical velocity of the ball just before it hits the ground? And here's the table. If you know about projectiles, then you'll know that their horizontal velocity is constant. So in this question, that means a constant horizontal velocity of 1.5 metres per second throughout the ball's flight. Already we can rule out three of the options. If you don't know much about projectile motion, then make sure to watch my video about it and the video of example questions that goes with it. Back to our question. To calculate the vertical velocity of the ball after 1.2 seconds, we use the equation A is equal to V minus U over T. A is the acceleration due to gravity on Earth, which is 9.8 ms to the minus 2. U is the ball's initial vertical velocity, which is 0 meters per second, since it's projected horizontally, and T is the time of 1.2 seconds. V is what we're trying to calculate, the vertical velocity of the ball just before it hits the ground. Let's substitute those values into the equation. The top line on the right hand side, V minus 0, can be simplified to V. And then, to make this the subject of the equation, we just need to multiply both sides by 1.2, giving us 9.8 times 1.2, which is 11.76 meters per second. To two significant figures, that's 12 meters per second, giving us the answer of C. So with multiple choice questions, a little knowledge can go a long way, but to really make sense of the subject and fulfill your potential, dropping a like on this video and subscribing to the channel it's definitely the way to go. See you in the next one.